Thank you. Welcome, everybody. This is uh, my first talk presenting for cybersecurity, so it's a very special moment. Thank you for being here with me today. Who am I? I'm Michelle Eggers. As mentioned before, I'm a security consultant at NetSpy, um, meaning I'm a pen tester, so that's what I do by trade. Um, I've been there a couple of years. I focus on mainframe pen testing. I do web applications as well, network penetra penetration testing. So um, I have a background in accounting, finance, and project management and uh, passionate about legacy tech security. I also have you know, a little hard out for industrial control systems, but mostly it's a mainframe type of world for me. So, and uh, I, I gotta give a shout out to my homie Phil Young here, who actually pulled me into mainframe. Um, it was a great, very long conversation we had that consisted of two sentences, wherein he said, you know, I'm thinking of getting you into mainframe. And I go, that sounds cool. And about a year later, here we are. So <laughs> it, was, it was great. It was a great, great introduction there. Um, today, we're going to do a quick history debrief about what mainframe tech even is, some notable changes that have occurred over the years with the technology. We're going to wait for him to pour the ice and the water in the back. Thank you, sir. It is 100 plus degrees, so we are thirsty. Uh, and then we're going to look at some mainframe today as far as why people elect to use it, what are the strengths of it. Um, we'll look at some modern threats to the mainframe ecosystem looking at some of the integrations that can introduce threats and also some things that we see in our pen tests uh, when the mainframes themselves, some sort of inherent insecurities that we might find. Uh, and then some tips to secure. I am a bit biased, of course. I'm a pen tester, so I'm definitely coming from the red team side, the offensive security side, but we're all working together here. So the goal is to make things more secure, whether you're defending or attacking. All right. So first, I'd like to see who does not currently work with mainframe uh, <laughs> great, great. Anybody with a hand up want to keep it up and say what you think mainframe is? Yes, can you define it? This is I'm asking you guys. IBM Z series. You could make an argument for IBM I series. No, you cannot make that argument. I can make that argument. We will have an argument. It's a computer that you trust to not die. Great. Yes, that's, that's pretty close. Well, that's a pretty good definition. So they are computers. They essentially are you know, high performance computer systems. They're specialized. They have very fast input output. They do billions of transactions on, on a daily basis. Um, they have you know, unique operating systems like ZOS or Linux on IBM Z. Um, they're computers. So they're just special fancy computers that we really like. They're very strong. We'll learn more about them in a minute. Uh, we're going to look at some myths now versus facts. Okay, so one myth is that mainframe is outdated, right? This is a picture. I love old pictures. You'll see that. Um, you know, this is like 1960s era. It's basically one computer in a huge room, and that's it. Or maybe you're thinking about an 80s movie, and there's the terminal with the green typeface. Um, all accurate as to that time frame, uh, but they have continuously evolved. They're among the earliest systems to adopt things like virtualization, built-in encryption. There's AI stuff coming down the pike, as with most technologies we're seeing today. So they're not locked in the past. They are current and being used right now. Another myth is that cloud replaces mainframe. Um, unfortunately, that's just not the case. We have things like regulatory compliance and barriers to entry that make that impossible. So if you're looking at the military, they can't put their databases in the cloud, right? Disallowed. If you're thinking about you know, your healthcare records, your you know, maybe uh, banks, we do a lot of bank testing, so all of that can't be in the cloud either, right? It has to be a little more locked down. Um, and then hybridization, I want to say, make a note of this as far as the cloud environment. We're more likely going to see hybridization as opposed to a full out replacement. So I think this ELT, that's a, is ex, mm, I can't remember the first word, but it's your, you export, load, and then translate. Yes, that's what it was. So you take what's on the mainframe. Right, you're going to export that data, and then you load it to the cloud. And then once it's in that final platform, then it gets translated. Right. So as opposed to trying to translate as you go, or try to translate within the mainframe environment something from COBOL. Right. You can take different steps to get there. So now once your data is in the cloud, then you can do your analytics on it. Then you can apply it to you know different different AI frameworks and things to get what you need out of that data that has been stored in the mainframe. Okay. And last myth I want to touch on is it's just too specialized. Who even does it, right? How many people are, are best friends with you know, mainframe people? Not many. Um, yes. <laughs> I can be your friend now, too. Um, 
Well, it is specialized, I'm not gonna lie to you, but there are initiatives under place to make mainframe more accessible. So I was just at a conference in March, uh, it's called SHARE, and they do a couple of them a year. It's like the biggest mainframe conferences that occur in the United States every year. Um, and I met a lot of people that were, you know, early career professionals or um, people who are in college actually learning COBOL, learning these very mainframe specific uh, languages and things about the stack itself so that they can specifically work in this industry. So there are initiatives in the industry to build that workforce that did take a hit. There was a dip, I would say from the mid 90s to like the 2010s where there weren't a lot of people coming into the workforce. It's being addressed, uh, so that's cool. And then we're seeing things, you know, of course, at Watson X AI Code Assist to translate COBOL to Java. It's a lot easier to find a Java developer than just somebody who works in COBOL, even though that is being addressed. Um, we're coming at it from different angles to sort of rebuild this workforce and get more traction in the industry. So practitioners, we're coming back up, okay. Brief history, as I mentioned before, and the old pictures, I love these. Okay, so this is the US Navy uh, Bureau of Ships, 1937. You've got analog computers, mechanical calculators, tabulating machines. These were not digital devices, right? This is like prototype type of things. This is sort of like the very, very old school beginning uh, used for gunnery calculations, navigation, engineering tasks, military, right? This was not available to businesses or anybody else. This was just for the military uh, for, you know, wartime efforts. In 1951, we see with the Eckert Mockley Computer Corporation, now we're getting to commercialization. Okay, now we're seeing it used for the US Census. They created the UNIVAC here um, to process the census data. And you know, businesses could start getting in on this. It wasn't just relegated specifically only to military applications at this time. Um, and then of course we had magnetic tape come into place which replaced punch cards um, because who wants to use punch cards? You know, maybe just for fun, but not for work. <laughs> 1965, uh, oh, this is great the IBM Z System 360, they released unified architecture. So previously, you would have different mainframes, right? These different boxes, and they had different languages. They couldn't talk to each other. You had to have someone specialized in each, you know, maybe operating system on each one. So unified architecture changed that. It made it so that each of the systems could talk to each other. So you could train in one thing and work with all the systems. Really cool. And then, of course, we get the solid state replacing the vacuum tubes. Vacuum tubes are no good in an earthquake, obviously. <laughs> so that was a great jump. Uh, 1970, innovation continued. Magnetic ferrite cores replaced by silicon drum memory chips. Virtual memory was introduced. Dynamic address translation also became a thing. So mainframe at the forefront, a lot of these things that we're still seeing in use today. Really awesome stuff. 1991, oh, we had some bad news. Okay, there was a death announcement. Right, this notable guy, Stuart Alsop, he was a talking head uh, of tech innovations and things that were occurring in, you know, in culture, right? He was saying, quote, I predict the last mainframe will be unplugged on March 15th, 1996. It just didn't happen. <laughs> I think he later retracted a statement, you know, um, but I think it's interesting that happened. And so when I mentioned previously that there was sort of a workforce slowdown and a, a, a slowdown in, um, you know, budgeting for building that. Um, this, is, this is part of the reason why. Okay, but as we can see that it is still in use by finance, by healthcare industries, government, um, and aviation as well. Uh, and of course, there are new developments. So there are some, it's already in place, but there's some machines coming out next year that are gonna be even stronger in this area. There's some changes coming with the Telem processor as well. Um, we're going to have some real-time AI inferencing for fraud detection. So instead of having your card, you know, you, someone runs it. Like someone in my family, actually, there was like an $800 Legoland charge. I'm like, we're, we're not in Legoland. What happened? Uh, <laughs> so instead of even getting a call 20 minutes later, um, as that transaction hits the mainframe and is processed, you have real-time fraud detection at that moment so that it could you know, feasibly stop it from proceeding to the point where now the credit card company has to eat that cost, right? Because that's what they do now with fraud. So something to consider, forward thinking. Okay, so why, why do we use mainframe? Okay, We've, we understand a little bit about the history, how it came to be what it is. Um, these are three things you're gonna hear about it when you're talking to somebody who knows mainframe, who cares about mainframe. Reliability, availability, and serviceability, right? Nice acronyms, we love our acronyms, RAS. 
Um, so reliability, it's got built-in redundancy across your various hardware levels, your input output paths, your power supply, your memory processors. It has error detection and correction, right? And it can handle up to seven magnitude earthquakes. Um, so if you're looking at something like the NASDAQ, right, New York Stock Exchange, they cannot have more than five and a half minutes of downtime in a given year. In a year, that is it, that is the max. So it's like 99.999% uptime is required for these industries. So mainframe can do that. That's why they use it, one of the reasons why they use it. Availability, right, you wanna make sure you can get your data. Got transaction rollback, checkpoint restart, complex job scheduling. Um, and this is just an example, but the Z15, 190 configurable cores on one system. So you're making your own finely tuned bespoke system within your mainframe, just basically out of the box. Very, very cool stuff. And serviceability, I love this. They're modular by design. So if part of your system needs repair or updating or you have to take a piece of it out, you know, we have things like parallel sysplex and basically you can just take this piece that needs to be fixed or changed and all those workflows, all those processes are gonna move over to your other parts of your mainframe. And there's no stop, there's no pause. You don't have to shut your entire system down, just that one part that you're fixing at the time. So. There's no, again, there's, no, there's like almost no downtime. It's pretty great. Um, In-depth logging, so you can solve your problems more easily. On-site, accessible for repair and maintenance. So if you think about a distributed cloud environment, um, quick story again from my life. I, was, I live near a Google plant, and I was you know, just a big warehouse with a bunch of servers. Driving home, night, I could see at the plant all these police cars and a couple fire engines, maybe an ambulance or two in front of the building, lights, like, what is going on? And then the road that led up to it was all blocked off, same thing. I didn't know what was going on. I may never find out, right? Was there a fire? Was there like a physical breach? If your data was there, would you know? Would your organization be told? You're like, oh, well, we have different regions. And what if there was like a coordinated attack on all the different regions? Hmm, something to think about. <laughs> but if it's on site at your facility, right? Hopefully you would think that your own security would, you know, you would be able to understand more quickly what is that's going on versus waiting for some kind of report from whoever is holding your data at that time. Okay, so um, your access is more tightly controlled. Huge benefit of mainframe. Right, oh, this is great. Okay, so <laughs> we talked about the earthquakes, right? Uh, let's hope this plays. But so about, I wanna say eight months ago, there was an earthquake in New Jersey. Uh, it hit a campus that had 200 mainframes on it. About, I think it was 4.5 magnitude. Not a single mainframe was damaged. There was no downtime. There was no loss of productivity whatsoever. They do this on a regular basis. They shake the dickens out of these machines. You don't want to do this to like a normal server rack, I don't think. <laughs> but a mainframe you can, and they'll be fine. Yeah. So we're almost done here. I mean, you just imagine, oh my gosh, that'd be so scary. Test complete. Test complete. Love that. All right. I go to the next one. Okay, so I skipped ahead a little bit, but you get the gist of where we're going here. We understand why we use mainframe, right? We understand it's strong, it's reliable, it's fast, billions of transactions, input, output, unmatched. Um, but what are some of the threats, right? What are some concerns we have in the mainframe landscape? So this is gonna talk about the expanded attack surface with integrations that occur as part of the entire topology that mainframe is a part of, right? So this TJX company's data breach, it was a payment card data breach. I hope that's not too small of a font for you guys, but this exposed 45.7 million credit debit card numbers, and this was a weakness in the wireless network, right? So we're gonna see a trend here. This one was a wireless network weakness. This next one is the Heartland Payment Systems breach. 100 million cards exposed, so this is more than double the previous one. This was at the hands of a global cyber fraud operation, and it was a combined attack of network and application vulnerabilities. All right, and this next one, Equifax data breach, so it was 2017. Now we're up to 147 million users compromised, and this time it was a web application that provided the initial access. So in each of these instances, we see that it wasn't initially the mainframe that was breached on its own, was other parts of the entire topology that were used to pivot into the mainframe to then exfiltrate the most critical, most private data. Okay, and then this one, um, this one was in Sweden. This was a big one, really big one. Uh, this dramatically changed how the entire government dealt with their data. Um, the whole investigation is actually public, so if you do a bit of research, you can get the documents offline. Um, I'm pretty sure it's in Swedish. 
<laughs> uh, you might, I think there's some in English, but it's not as, um, it doesn't have as much in it as maybe the Swedish documents, but you guys can figure out how to translate it if you really want to get into it and find it. It's there. Um, initial access through the FTP network connection of 23. We don't like that. That was present. That was part of it. Um, the hackers used Hercules, which is an emulator, to run ZOS, and they downloaded files and tax processing source. They got all the source code for the tax processing software from the logic servers, from the government servers. Really bad news. Um, I use an emulator for my testing, actually. I use X3270. So it's not like impossible to get these and use them. Oh, 10 minutes. Oh my gosh, I'm hurry. Okay, they use zero day vulnerabilities, but part of those were uh, default configurations, right? Don't use default configurations, please. Uh, let's see, we'll go down a little bit. And you guys can read that. They use John the Ripper open source stuff. Like it's not incredibly complex. People just chain things together and then they make an attack. So just be safe and be aware, okay? Um, I'm gonna show you a demo now, right? I'm gonna tell you what the demo is real quick and then I'll show you it. Um, so what I'm going to do in the demo is I'm going to authenticate to a logical partition in LPAR, which is a re like piece of your mainframe. Remember I told you about the configurable cores and creating your own bespoke environment, right? So you have your LPAR. Let me see me authenticate to it. Assume that the endpoints that I navigate to have already been enumerated previously in the same pen test, okay? And then the access for the user that I am authenticating with is restricted, right? It's a lower level user, so it only can get to specific resources. Um, and then we're going to think, okay, well, is there another way to access? Let's take a look. Okay, so this is our nets by LPAR, right? Logging in through TSO. This is me. I drop in my password here. Okay. ISPF. Now, what I'm doing is I'm getting to a place where I can use a sort of Unix based um, command line utility within the mainframe. Okay, so that's what I'm doing here. You can put commands in here, but now. Once I'm here, it's, you know, this is a little more familiar for people who use something like Linux, right? So I can use commands like CD. This is an endpoint that has previously been enumerated, right? Oh, cool, I found this op secrets. What's, what's in there? Okay, I'm gonna list it out with my ls command. Got a readme.txt and an ssh key. Okay, let's cat the readme. This is the ssh private key. You need to log in as an admin, do not share. <laughs> ah, darn, okay, well, what if I just try to cat the ssh key anyways? Can I do it? That permission denied. Okay, game over. Or is it? No, it isn't. I can go to the same IP over the web interface just using port 8080, right? No, no. <laughs> have I authenticated? No, I have not. So this is another endpoint, right? It was previously enumerated. We know it exists. This here, when I use that feature, it retrieves data from the mainframe, right? That's happening on the back end. I don't even need to use an intercepting tool. I'm just using the network tab in the browser, okay? So now I'm going to generate the request by issuing this. All right, here's my post request. I'm going to crack that open and see what's in it. You know, we're going to see some headers, and then we'll see what's in the message body at the bottom here. Okay, sorry, it's so small. But this is, this is part of the request that is retrieving the files. Okay, so what if I change that to the existing endpoint that I'm already aware of with the secret file? Is it going to work? I got 200 okay. Sounds promising. <laughs> Okay, so there's the endpoint I went to. Uh, what's in the response? Do you think I got anything? I, I did. <laughs> I got the, yeah, yeah. Well, this is the, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so this is completely unauthenticated, right? I could not access this file as an authenticated real user on the mainframe itself within the system because I was not an admin level user. So I just went to the web app, completely unauthenticated, and modified the request, and now I have whatever I want. I could probably uh, pull a whole lot more out of there. This is just a proof of concept. Um, but this is based on a real finding from a real company. It's not exactly like this, because no one wants to get in trouble, but this really happened. So it's important to secure, OK? <laughs> um, so that in mind. Is the mainframe itself secure outside of these sort of external peripherals that are making it uh, you know, insecure and dangerous? Well, yes. So these are some things that we do see in our pen tests. Broken access control, local file included data sets, Unix files, insecure FTP. We see this a lot, unauthenticated access. You know, there have been instances where I would log in, but actually not log in. Like I would start the authentication process back out and I could still run CICS or Kix commands or maybe run Kims and run these, you know, sort of 
Mm, there should be authenticated processes. I should be at least authorized to run them, and I'm not even authenticated. So we do see this stuff. SQL injections in DB2 databases, job control language injections, rec scripts injections, security misconfigurations, default credentials, like we saw in the Logica attack, weak password policies. We get mixed, you know, case ins uh, insensitive passwords all the time. Uh, are people not using something like an external security manager? I think most big shops are using something like this. Um, but just in case, please use it if you're around mainframe. Okay, implement these things as possible. So how do we secure, right? We see that maybe there's some insecurities in the mainframe itself or maybe with some of the uh, integrations that we find. Okay, so here's some ways to secure. <laughs> as the blue team said, I promised you earlier today. Um, secure with network controls. Please keep in mind your entire topology. Don't look at mainframe as its own sort of off in the corner tech by itself because it's not. It has API calls. It has maybe you're, you have your cloud integrations. Maybe you're trying to roll out some AI inferencing. Who knows what you're doing, but you've got to keep the whole topology in mind. Um, make appropriate use of your logical partitions, regions, your ESM tools, disallow unencrypted protocols, disallow unencrypted protocols, please, and keep up with your patches and updates. Good advice for anybody doing anything with a computer ever. Um, secure with compliance, CSI benchmark, CS, CIS benchmarking. And actually, I love this one, the DSA sticks, right? This is Department of Defense. I've used this on an actual test. So I had a DB2 test, and they had actual commands that I could go to and just pull, run this command and see if you can, you know, get this file. Run this command, see if you can elevate your privileges. It's very, very, very helpful. Um, and then secure with your ongoing reviews. Monitor your traffic with SOC. Logs are robust. Take advantage. Audit your identity and access management on a regular basis. Implement MFA. Implement MFA, right? Yes, please, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, and establish recurring audits for all of your features and conduct frequent pen testing. I love a good internal pen testing team, right? It's a different mindset, of course, because they're closer to the stack. You know, maybe they come into play when they're rolling out a new feature or something and they need to poke at it before it becomes live for whatever reason. Um, but as far as getting a fresh set of eyes, you know, that's what we do, that's what I love. Like, I'm not gonna get your source code typically on an engagement, I'm just gonna go in there and see what I can safely break and then tell you how to fix it so that I can be much more secure in the long run for everybody involved, okay. So as a quick review, what did we discuss today? What did we cover? All right, here's a summary. Mainframe is not going away anytime soon, right? Stuart Alsop was wrong, it didn't die in 96. All right, we rely on it globally to support finance, healthcare, government, and other critical industries. There are more possible vulnerabilities now and more all the time with the increasing in, uh, integrations in the environment. But with diligence, we can combat these threats together, right? So thank you again. Please stay connected. Again, I'm Michelle Eggers, security consultant at NetSpy. You can get me here. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. Thank you. I was talking really fast to fit it all in. He said at three. Yeah, if there's any questions, I have evidently three minutes. Yes, <laughs> yes Phil, oh no. <laughs> How have you been enjoying your mainframe journey? And then try to repeat the question. How have I been enjoying my mainframe journey? Um, I love it. I love sort of semi-niche things. I love legacy tech. Uh, I love complicated, complex environments. And mainframe is probably the least easy thing I've done in pen testing. So I love it for that reason. It's very difficult. So, yes. Yes. How often do companies actually fix all those uh, flaws? One person fix the one middleware issue and call it a day. Uh -huh. So I would say from, from my side with what I do, what I see is if there is um, anywhere from like a high to a critical finding, they addressed almost immediately. Like we have to give a status report basically same day. So if it's very dangerous, we tell them almost immediately and they do fix it pretty rapidly. Uh, I'd say they're pretty responsive to medium findings as well. But the lower end, maybe there's a bit more lag, I would say, as far as, you know, most organizations, not even just people we work with, but in general, um, you typically put out the fires first. So. Hmm. Does it affect the back end directly? 
Uh huh. Yeah. So they just have to tighten down their access control issue. The, Mm. Yeah. I can hardly hear him and see his face. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know if your question was answered by Phil or not. But. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. I, IBM has this. N oh, sorry. Go, you can finish. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's worth it to invest in what you feel most passionate about, truly. Um, don't just chase, uh, you know, what's hot or what, what has money, right? Make sure you have a bit of passion in it. Um, but as far as resources for early career professionals, uh, IBM New to Z is a really great resource. They have um, training modules and connections with mentors and things like that. So, and I don't work for them at all. I don't have hardly, but yeah. New to Z, it's a great, great opportunity. So, okay, I'm done. They're kicking me out. Love you. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs>